A while back, I made a prototype of a Commodore 64 PLA replacement chip in FPGA and covered this extensively on my Easy Contents blog website. Recently, I have designed a PCB and I thought it was a good opportunity to make a video that covers the whole creation process from scratch. So if you are interested in how something like this comes about, or maybe are thinking of creating a similar project yourself, then this video is for you. But let's start from the beginning and tell you the reason why I even wanted to create another PLA replacement chip in the first place. When I got this Commodore 64, it was in a non-working condition. The PLA chip was broken. I could have ordered a replacement, but during that time I was also playing around with FPGA development and had a couple of programmable Altera chips. So I thought to give it a try and create a PLA replacement myself. This project is sponsored by PCBWay that kindly offered to create this PCB. The chip that I have used is this Altera EPM7032. It utilizes a PLCC44 socket, which is easily to solder and friendly to create prototypes. It's a CPLD chip and it basically works the same as an FPGA chip, but has a small advantage that it can store the contents in a non-volatile memory. So when you turn it off, it will be not erased. In an FPGA chip, you usually need to use an external flash chip to accomplish that. Altera, which by the way was acquired by Intel in 2015, offers a free version of the development environment called Quartus Lite, where you can program the chips in hardware description languages like VHDL or Verilog. To create the PLA replacement chip, we will be using VHDL. PLA stands for Programmable Logic Array and originally it was based on a Signetics 82S100 chip with 16 inputs and 8 outputs, which could be programmed with desired logic. It functions as a traffic center for communication between all the chips inside the Commodore 64. This logic of the PLA chip can be represented with a truth table, where given inputs always trigger specific outputs. When we look at this table inside the Transacto magazine from 1986 and examine a useful example, we see that inside this column the address bus A15 contains A1, A14 A0 and A13 A1, which means that an address in the range of A000 and BFFF hexadecimal is placed by the microprocessor on the bus. In the output section, we see that the basic output is put low, which means that the basic chip will be enabled. There is also another case when the same address is used. This can happen when a game cartridge of 16 kilobytes is inserted into the C64. In that case, the game and XROM inputs are pulled low. And when that happens, the basic chip will not be enabled and instead the memory inside the cartridge will get addressed. If you are interested in how cartridges work, you can also watch my other video where I build cartridges on a breadboard. Next step will be to make a translation from the truth table to boolean logic. For this we can use a method called the sum of products. Let me briefly show how this works based on a simple example of an XOR gate. This is how the truth table of this gate looks like. If we look at the output, then it is true in the case when input A is true and input B is false, or when A is false and B is true. The other cases produce false output. To define the sum of products for this gate, we only need to look at cases where the output is true. So this happens exactly as we have mentioned before. Output is A and not B, or not A and B. This is enough information for a logic chip like an FPGA to make an XOR gate. 
The PLA chip is a bit more complex and has multiple outputs. When we look at the output of ROM H, the output is false when AEC, XROM, VA13 and VA12 inputs are set to true and also when the game input is set to false. But it is also the case when the conditions of the other two rows apply. The condition can be written like this. Note that the NOT in front of the statement indicates that the output will be false. After gaining these insights, we can try to recreate this logic of the PLA inside the Altera CPLD chip using the VHDL language. We will need an older version of Quartus 2 Web Edition as it needs to support the family of Mac 7000 chips. The newer versions do not support it. An account on the Intel website is also required before downloading the software. I have placed the download link in the description of this video. The best is to get the combined files bundle as they will allow you to install everything in one go. After starting the application we can create a new project using the new project wizard. The first page gives some introduction, we can skip that. On this page we can select a directory for the project. I will choose this location and the name of the project which will be EasyPLA. In the next step we can add files to the project but we have none yet so press next. This page is important as we can choose the chip that we will be using. It is from the Max 7000S family and the name is EPM 7032 SLC44-10. We click next and use the default seer and press finish. When we click on file new there is an option to create an empty VHDL file. At this point we can write the whole code from scratch, but let's look for some help. When we search on C64 PLA VHDL GitHub keywords, then one of the first hits is the GitHub page of Frank Bass. There we can find a repository which includes the VHDL code for the PLA chip. Let's copy the raw file into Quartus save it and walk through the file to see how it works. On top of the file there are some headers which will allow us to use boolean logic inside this VHDL file. The inputs and outputs of the chip are defined inside the entity declaration. If we look at the pinout of the PLA chip we can see that it matches this. The next step is to define how inputs and outputs relate to each other. This is described in the architecture. The arguments of the process function are the input pins of the chip. There are two states that the chip can be in. The first one is when all of the outputs are in a high impedance state. This happens when the output enable is high. When output enable input goes low, then the second state is enabled and the output pins will be set according to the defined inputs. Now we know how this logic comes about, we can investigate how it is written in VHDL. The ROM H output is low when the three conditions that we spoke before are met. There is actually a small mistake in this VHDL code. Let me explain. The first line refers to this column of the truth table. We can see here that the inputs high RAM, A15, A13 and RW should be high and A14, AEC, XROM and GAME are expected to be low. However, the AEC is reversed here. I am not sure about the reason for that, but it is throughout the whole code. The second and the third line in the code match these two columns of the truth table. All these conditions are glued together using the OR statement and the NOT in front of all of them means that ROM H will be set to a logical zero when any of these three lines are true. The same is done to the other outputs. The last line for the CASRAM output is the longest 
as it needs to cover all of these cases here. First, let's invert all of the AEC values inside the code. I will do that by first replacing all of the NOT AEC to a token string, then the string AEC to NOT AEC, and finally the token to AEC. Next, we will need to assign the inputs and outputs of this VHDL entity to real pins on the chip. This can be done by clicking on the pin planner icon in the toolbar. At this point, the list is empty, as the application does not know what the inputs and outputs are. We need to compile the code first. And we got an error. Ah. The replacement of the AEC string did not need to put the NOT in front of this AEC pin definition on this line. The rest should be fine. How about another try compiling this thing? And we got another error. What is it now? Oh. EasyPLA is undefined. Apparently, the VHDL code expects that the name of the file should be the same as of the entity. Ok, let's change the C64PLA7 to EasyPLA. And give it another try. This time it's a success. We can ignore the warnings. When we now click on the pin assignment button, we can see that the pins are now selectable and we can assign them. To see what all the pin symbols mean, we can click on the legend icon. Let's stick to the user I.O. pins. The pentagonal shapes are used for programming and we do not need to assign them here. We also don't need the clock pins. The pins marked with an X are usually for power and ground connections. We can assign the pins by selecting them from the list or dragging them onto the graphics. After it's done, we need to compile the design again. We can see that the whole design has taken 12 of 32 macro cells, so we still have some room on our CPLD chip. For fun, you can also visualize how the design is implemented using logic gates. Hey, you could even use the design and try to make the PLA chip out of 7400 series chips. At this point we are finished with the code. In order to program the chip, we can use the USB blaster. But first, we need to install the drivers for it. After inserting the device into the USB port, Windows will recognize it, but won't install the drivers. We can do that inside the device manager by right-clicking on the USB blaster icon and selecting to update the driver. Then we can browse for its location inside the installed Quartus drivers folder And after a while, the drivers should be installed on your system. The next step would be to program the chip. Unfortunately, we are not using a development board and cannot simply plug in the USB cable and be done with it. We will need to make the connections of all the JTAG pins ourselves. As I mentioned before, I have made this prototype board and soldered some pin headers onto it. It worked fine, however the look of this board was not very appealing, so I have designed a PCB. Let's assemble it. We will start by inserting the rounded pin headers on the bottom of the PCB and insert it into the breadboard for easy soldering. Then we can solder all the pins. 
Let's give it a quick rinse with IPA. Now we will need a PLCC44 socket. Luckily, I still have some in stock. We can now insert it on the front of the PCB. Pin number 1 should be located in the top left corner. We can now proceed to solder the socket. It's a bit tricky, as the pins are close to the headers. Now we can insert the programming headers and the small 5 volt pin header. We need to provide 5 volt to it from another source as the USB blaster programming header will not do that. I have also glued some blue tech on the pins so they won't move while soldering. We can now insert the Altera chip into the socket. And then insert the USB blaster pin headers and provide the chip with 5 volts of power. Oh, by the way, I have made the 5 volts power supply out of an old USB cable by attaching a 2 pin header onto it. Anyhow, we are now ready to program the chip. When we click on the programmer icon inside Quartus and then on the hardware setup button, we can choose the USB blaster as currently selected hardware. Then we can specify the file that we want to program onto the chip. This file was previously compiled and stored inside the output files folder. Now we can select the program and verify checkboxes and click on the start button to program the chip. After a short while, the CPLD chip will be programmed. Let's insert the freshly programmed EasyPLA into the C64 to see if it works. And it's working! It was 4 years ago when I first made the uh, PLA prototype and uh, it feels very fulfilling to finally see uh, the project come to an end. I have made all the KiCad design files and the Quartus VHDL code available for free download. Uh, so if you're interested you can uh, download. The links are in the description of this video. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching and I hope to see you uh, again in the future video. Bye.